Okay. All right, Dimitri, uh, do you want to share your screen for this, for sharing a bit about the history of Carvel Tools? Yeah, I, uh, I brought just a couple of pictures, just to make <laughs> it a little bit more entertaining. Awesome. All right, take it away. I was afraid you were going to say slides. Boom, slides. Tricked you there. <laughs> uh, no, it's just... Uh, uh, Funny enough, I don't think I have any other uh, picture creation software aside from uh, the 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 PowerPoint or whatever the Google, what is it called? Google presentation or something. Anyway, um, uh, we have some friends from Twilio uh, on the call, um, and one thing that uh, they've uh, uh, asked recently is, can we? provide a little bit more historical kind of a context into some of this uh, tool creation and maybe how that also um, um, influences maybe some of the future ideas and whatnot. So I just kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time and obviously this is interactive. So anybody jump in and add, uh, ask questions, comments, whatever. Um, but yeah, so let's, uh, let's kind of dive into it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and excuse my cough, still recovering here. Um, so Carvel has uh, started kind of organically, uh, if one might say. Uh, I've been um, working on various configuration management, infrastructure management, container management solutions uh, uh, for a long time. And so over the years, uh, you know, certain ideas, uh, you know, they, they kind of form and, you know, get refined, polished, maybe certain ideas, obviously, uh, uh, quickly die or slowly, maybe even die if, uh, if they don't make much sense. Um, and so a lot of that kind of an initial inspiration for Carvel came out of this type of experiences, right? Working with real production environments, working with real users, with their production environments, working with, uh, just different types of organizations and different types of users, uh, you know, because organizations may also influence how you build your software and how you actually manage your software. <clears throat> and so um, this kind of a, I don't know, pile of uh, factors uh, led me on the road of um, trying to think about this different concrete problems that we were um encountering into various places, right? And so you will notice that Carvel is really um, fairly decomposed. Um, it's not a monolithic tool. I worked on projects that uh, were built in a very monolithic way, and there's definitely benefits to such tools. Uh, there's obviously downsides that come with such uh, design decisions. And so it was kind of an interesting um, design kind of a, um, journey to take and how do you actually decompose some of these different um, processes into smaller, maybe simpler, uh, uh, a little bit more focused tools, right? And so to make it a little bit shorter here, <laughs> um, Carvel started out with, uh, I believe, uh, first tool was KWT, which uh, is actually not in any way really a uh, uh, mentioned on the website, I think, or maybe it is one of the experimental boxes, and it still kind of continues to be experiment. Uh, this was actually a little, uh, <clears throat> a little journey that I was taking to um, uh, to just play around with networking. How do you actually bridge the um, the network uh, on the cluster? How do you bridge it to your local computer? Uh, and this is something that's been, for example, uh, done by some of the other tools out there. There's a little section about that in, uh, in, in GitHub. Uh, but while playing with all that stuff, um, you know, I was deploying all kinds of uh, resources or workloads to Kubernetes. You know, one of them was Knative, I think, another one was Cert Manager and a few other things like Istio and things like that. And <clears throat> I've come to... Um, you know, from my previous experience, like certain, you know, aspects of how do you actually converge a system, right? Uh, been working with declarative systems for some time. And so there was a kind of a bar uh, of uh, 
experience that I was reaching, seeking, but I wasn't really getting, right? And obviously, you know, we have tools like kubectl and a few other tools that <coughs> help you do it. But um, I was trying to um, see if we can iterate on that experience and make that you know, make, make that experience a little bit more transparent. You know, I've always had the challenge trusting tools, especially in the production environment at 2 a.m., what will it do? Uh, and so, um, you know, there's all kinds of great influences out there in ecosystem like Terraform, for example, where they really split this notion of planning and applying. And so the first tool that actually um, popped out out of KWT. This was actually some code that I was playing around with in KWT and it um, <coughs> got extracted out as its own project was CAP, uh, this, this little bit over here, this box. Um, and you know the principles behind CAP were really about how do you actually um, provide that confidence to a user who's using it to converge the system. Um, and you can, you know, you can hopefully <coughs> hopefully see that um, level of, uh, um, uh, well, you, you can hopefully get that, gain that extra confidence by actually being presented with a set of steps that will happen to your cluster, right? Now, there's all kinds of other uh, innovations that went into CAP as I was deploying various types of uh, workloads. And, you know, obviously the tool continues to be, um, you know, improved on a daily basis by a much larger team than just me. <clears throat> but there's definitely some interesting um, uh, annoyances, one might say, that CAP tries to hide from the user that you may see, for example, with kubectl, or you may see uh, <coughs> with, with some of the other tools that may um, even kind of uh, hit some of the limitations that Kubernetes provides, right? Maybe a tiny little example to make this concrete might be some, some resources might be immutable, right? Or maybe uh, a field within the resource is immutable, right? And so that becomes much harder to automate uh, without any kind of manual intervention if you don't have a certain level of configuration at your fingertips so that your tool can do this for you, right? So anyway, so CAP kind of popped out of there. And so once CAP popped out of this uh, tool and became kind of its own thing, you know, I was really, uh, you know, just exploring and researching this other space like, okay, well, but how does one actually, you know, develop and iterate on maybe something that you have deployed, uh, that you want to deploy to a Kubernetes cluster, right? And, you know, I'll just, I'll just throw in here like YTT and KBuild, for example, right? Both of these tools, they again, try to focus on this, um, idea that let, let's try to uh, solve this, you know, problem, let's say of configuration building, configuration mutation uh, in, in, in a tool that only knows how to do that, right? So for example, YTT does not know anything about Kubernetes. It does not know anything about what's going to happen with the output that's coming in there. Uh, it just knows how to deal with data structures, data structures being, you know, maps, arrays, uh, you know, document sets, documents, et cetera, right? And it just happens that I was also obviously in a Kubernetes ecosystem. So YAML is uh, is one of the uh, kind of central points to it because everybody's working with YAML. <coughs> um, now, of course, influences of um, the design influences in YTT came again from previous experiences of bumping around the configuration gradient, you know, on one side, you have templating, uh, and some folks are all into templating, and it solves lots of their problems. And then, of course, on the other side, you end up with um, kind of a patching mechanisms, right, um, or overlaying tools, as some folks call it. And so there is that gradient, right? And, you know, you definitely find tools that either go into one direction or go into another direction. Uh, in my opinion, they're really the, the, the mix the, the, the perfect tool is somewhere, you know, in the middle, 80, 20 situation where a lot of the stuff, for example, for your own authoring of configuration, you really want to be in the templating land, but then you still need that 20% power of uh, overlays, for example, to, to customize, to shape that, uh, that result. And, and maybe, you know, of course, maybe you're not authoring your configuration. Maybe you're actually picking up configuration from somewhere else. And then, so then maybe your use case is more, um, 
is, is more towards the overlaying versus templating, right? And combining those two sides um, within a single tool, within a single language, within a single set of primitives, uh, you know, within a tool that allows you to do this kind of a hermetic execution um, really was a, <clears throat> in my opinion, kind of a hit, hit the sweet spot to be genetic enough tool where you can actually use it for all kinds of purposes. Uh, powerful enough where, again, you're able to deal with these different types of uh, workflows and use cases and different types of uh, kind of organizational complexity. Uh, but yet at the same time, you know, it, it's not a, um, it, it's not maybe, a, <clears throat> um, it, it, it doesn't push you towards um, uh, maybe a very opinionated way of doing it, right? Because you, you can solve a lot of problems if, if you get to have all your stakeholders agree on, on a particular pattern, right? But if you are really working with all kinds of different configuration coming in from any, you know, anywhere, um, you, you really need that flexibility. And so templating overlaying, kind of bringing it together in one tool, um, allowing programmatic access to it, I, I, I think kind of a, hits that sweet spot. And of course, you know, um, uh, as, a, as I already mentioned for CAP, you know, we're, we're continuing to iterate on YTT, continuing to elevate some of the ideas there, you know, every week or so when John and I, for example, uh, have our chats, uh, you know, there's, there's always some more futuristic things that we could be doing. It's not quite, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not quite on uh, <coughs> concretely, um, uh, concretely figured out, but there's cool ideas about static analysis around the configuration. Uh, how do we, you know, maybe visualize the configuration better to understand how things are happening and whatnot. And so, so that was, that, that was, that was kind of how YTT got born. It, it's, it, it's really this, this, this pain with the existing tools that either shift to one side of the gradient or shift to another side of the gradient and just don't quite, don't quite give you what you want. Um, Over here is actually KBuild uh, <laughs> turned out to be, uh, in my opinion, <clears throat> that little thing that just kind of fell out uh, as an semi-obvious thing, at least at, le at least in the workflows that I, I tend to use. Um, so we have CAP that's doing the converging. We have YTT that's doing you know configuration mingling. Um, if you just run this pipeline right on your local machine and you know you get your stuff deployed the ultimate question becomes well how do you actually build the image and throw the image into your yaml and whatnot and of course you can try to build something custom with some shell scripts and you know ytt maybe uh inserting image references and whatnot but that that just doesn't quite scale because then you have to do this every single time for every single project and it's just different <clears throat> so k build kind of comes in and says you know what we we know that there's plenty of great tools to build images, you know, Docker, build packs, Basel, all kinds of tools, right? How do we actually take those tools and just easily integrate that into a flow that, you know, you might have over here, right? And by the way, as, <coughs> as an example here, because, <clears throat> because these tools are really just focusing on their own uh, uh, single kind of a purpose, right? Um, this kind of workflows, right? The idea was always, we don't want to solve uh, or we don't want to force users to change their entire workflows, right? We want to really help the user solve a problem that they have, that they coming to us to say, hey, look, I got this problem to maybe deploy or got this problem to build images or maybe it's something else, right? And so tool specifically designed to solve a particular problem and then continue on with your rest of the flow that you may already have or you know of course you can you know adopt some newer tools over time and maybe you do end up using all the carvels tools together or something like that right uh, <clears throat> so anyway so kind of a k build come uh, came after uh, after that and it just kind of uh, solidified this thinking around you know each one of these tools is really just passing in the information to the next tool right within the kubernetes ecosystem we have that shared format for what is this set of resources, right? And so, uh, you know, the, the interface between these tools is, is all the same. And of course, you know, there could be other ecosystem tools out there that, you know, again, use the same interface. So kind of a plug and play there. <coughs> uh, 
And um, so, yeah, so that was kind of just the, 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 the basic kind of a thinking around like, okay, we got all these tools that, that kind of work uh, together well, and they also work with other tools well. Uh, and so then, you know, kind of a Carvel project started iterating into some of the other interesting problems that we have faced historically, right? So we have image package, for example. I kind of threw this picture in. Maybe it's a little bit um, uh, funny looking picture that image package just comes before here. But what I'm trying to showcase here, right, is that maybe in your one type of workflow, right, you're really picking up this configuration from your Git repository, like you Git cloned and you run the steps. But a lot of times you also want to capture your, uh, you know, workload in some kind of a Im immutable way, right? And look at that. We actually have registries. Uh, they know how to hold content. Um, <coughs> I think uh, uh, I want to say uh, image package, in my opinion, kind of a came out uh, <clears throat> at the right time where uh, it, it hasn't kind of a, kicked in for all kinds of other um, users that, hey, it's actually a really interesting idea to store content in registries. And so I think image package kind of came at the right time and said, okay, well, you know what, let's let's actually store other types of content that you may use in, uh, you know, in, in, in various other places, right? Um, and so we have image package over here as an example being used to store Kubernetes configuration, right? And so of course, once you fetch that configuration, uh, then you end up, you know, maybe going through this flow, maybe you end up, I don't know, storing your Helm chart inside the uh, image package, uh, inside the registry, uh, maybe some other types of configuration. Uh, and maybe, you know, some people talk about like storing their <clears throat> ML data inside uh, image package images. So uh, really uh, kind of a flexible, again, image package doesn't know what it's storing. It just says, I'll store it for you and I'll grab it for you on the way out. Um, <clears throat> now, what actually becomes interesting with specifically for the Kubernetes case though, is that if you think of registry as a place where you store assets, right? There's clearly some relationships between these assets, right? And again, the registry official APIs at this time uh, or in, and definitely at the time of the image package creation, they do not have this notion of how do you actually describe some of this relationship. And so image package decided to uh, kind of uh, explore this area of like, what if we're actually able to store the relationship as part of the metadata around the, uh, the bundles, right? And actually use that metadata in some kind of useful ways, right? So this is a little picture of just showing like you, you have your bundle that's built by image package. And of course you have your content, but then you have all these images and whatever, right? Uh, that you you reference, right? And so you can kind of build hierarchies and you can kind of build your software graph. Uh, and this of course becomes really handy if you actually need to move that graph maybe to a different registry. If you're trying to understand what is the graph of all the stuff that I'm deploying, right? Uh, you probably want to make sure that your production in environment is not running some random images and whatnot, right? And so being able to kind of capture all that holistically uh, via same mechanism that you use, for example, to store container images, um, being able to attach and really reference this uh, just seem like powerful concepts that we should explore and kind of push forward, right? Uh, and of course, you know, our own usage within VMware is, is, is very much all about that, right? We want to be able to take the software that we build locally uh, within VMware and then bring that out to our users, right? <clears throat> and so this is a kind of a, a, a typical use case that image package could really be used for. Um, all right, I'll jump to the next one over here real quick. And so, you know, stepping back from the image package, you know, we have those, we have this kind of a little pipeline that you might be running locally, you might be running somewhere in your CI, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with running this exact same thing in your CI, right? The tools are designed to be run in any type of environment. Um, but what if you actually run the same tools in, in your Kubernetes cluster, right? And so this is where idea of cap controller kind of came about and uh, you know it evolved with the same tools. It actually evolved by a lot of the feedback from <coughs> from our users around like, hey, I want to do this, I want to do that. And so app CR concept in uh, cap controller really evolved rapidly um, 
just to get to this stage where you're able to flexibly combine uh, these ideas of where to fetch the data from, where to how to template the data, and then you know how do you actually deploy it, right? And so this concept or th this pipeline that you might be running in CI, you could also decide, hey, you know what? Let me let me have a first class API for that in Kubernetes cluster. And this is a little picture of kind of a uh, you know, forget about the stop part, but AppCR really just focuses on this three um, three pieces, right? Fetch, template, deploy to represent an application, a workload running on your cluster, right? And so once we had that kind of idea around like, okay, well, we have this AppCRs, right? How do you actually, you know, take advantage of them? Well, you could obviously do... GitOps on your cluster with your app CRs, right? You can configure it to pull, you know, maybe from Git, maybe from HTTP endpoint, maybe from, I don't know, image package bundle, from anywhere, right? And you can actually do all kinds of massaging of the Kubernetes configuration with YTT becomes again, really powerful because you can really take whatever somebody else, maybe uh, an example, maybe, maybe somebody, uh, uh, needed to change a bunch of stuff about cert manager installation, or maybe they wanted to change a bunch of stuff around how they deploy an application in production or, or, or the staging one, right? And so kind of a relying on the tools to do all that heavy lifting and really cap controller staying, really just sitting there and delegating out all this work, um, it, it, it seemed to be uh, a really good idea, right? And so we kept on, kept on exploring it, kept on, uh, kept on adding the features to kind of support these different use cases. And actually, uh, a bit, a bit later after that, um, kind of ideas came around. Well, okay, you have this app CR. That's great. I can, I can, you know, put an app CR uh, into some place, and then I can give it to somebody, and they can also, I guess, install the same type of content into their cluster, right? Well, the kind of annoying part about that, right, is that suddenly uh, users who are taking this app CR and maybe bringing it to their cluster, right, they're exposed to all these details that they may not care about, right? And so this was kind of the idea around packaging, right, is that really we just want to be able to assign some name and a version, right, <clears throat> and let the user reference that and not really worry about the underlying implementation of where the thing is coming from, how it's configured, you know, and maybe how it's deployed, right? And so that was the kind of idea of, okay, well, we have this building block, AppCR. Let's, let's, let's build the package install on top of that, right? We want all that functionality for free, right? It's the same kind of model as the pod and a deployment, right? The deployment really just delegates a lot of the heavy lifting to the pod. And so same exact thinking here. Package install delegates a lot of that heavy lifting to AppCR. And of course, you know, somehow you have to build the AppCR, right? You have to... Uh, create it in the cluster, right? Uh, what I mean is the controller needs to create in the cluster. And so the package CR idea uh, is really just, hey, uh, attach a bunch of metadata to an app CR template, and that's what's going to get created. Uh, now, again, once you get to this layer, suddenly this, again, naturally starts falling out uh, as, a, as a next step. Okay, well, I have all this bunch of package CRs. How do I actually give it to the users, right? And so again, the next idea was, okay, well, we'll just put them in a package repository, whatever that may be. And so in this, in this picture, I guess it says uh, package repository could be an OCI bundle. And that's, for example, my favorite option, but there's no reason why that couldn't be inside a Git repository or some other place. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, so, so this was kind of the general um, uh, transition or, or not transition, but evolution of these tools and of this kind of a, um, of these concepts, right? The principles that we're still, you know, very much sticking to is that ideally, you know, the tools are single purpose. They know how to do something well and they delegate the, the other type of functionality that you may find to different tools, right? And there's actually an example of secret gen versus cap controller that came up in a uh, earlier uh, uh, section was secret gen is all about dealing with secrets, right? Generating some secrets, or maybe actually one of the features there is also sharing the secrets between the namespaces, right? So cap controller doesn't really have a, any special notion of a secret, but secret gen is all about secrets. And so there's, there's all kinds of an interesting um, 
kind of a division of labor you can imagine between these two controllers. Um, so anyway, I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll just say okay. So this this was all kind of a where we are, how we got here. Um, you know, the principles I think that we've tried to abide by within within the tools and just within the APIs and concepts, right? Uh, we believe they are. Uh, maybe universal or maybe universal is actually maybe a bad word, but uh, they are solid enough to keep on building uh, additional types of maybe tools or additional types of experiences on top. Um, and so as we proceed into the future, right, we're obviously looking for how do we, for example, polish uh, this workflows in particular way, right? How do we, for example, uh, solve some of the problems that maybe local uh, development uh, uh, use cases really required to be solved, right? Or how do we, for example, focus on particular packaging related um, issues? Like, for example, you know, if, if you end up having 10,000 packages, right? How do we evolve the system in such a way that that's, that's really not a problem, right? And so I think the foundations that we've kind of laid out and some of the kind of a rules we've set up where certain things uh, like where certain responsibilities within the software goes uh, seems to keep on, I don't know, I, I think at least in my opinion, work out in our favor. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, at maybe at a, at a more strategic, larger, kind of a big picture point, uh, we absolutely want um, our uh, greater, you know, Kubernetes ecosystem to embrace some of these APIs and tools as, uh, as you know, uh, tools that anybody can expect to use, right? So, for example, a lot of the open source projects we would love if uh, they would be uh, providing packages uh, for their software from their repositories, and we're obviously working towards making the package authoring experience uh, easier and more. Uh, uh, just accessible to everybody. Um, we uh, we also hope that even aside from the packaging side of it, uh, a lot of these tools uh, are uh, really used in this different context for the in-house application development, right? Uh, how do you actually, uh, you know, configure the multi-cluster systems, multi-environment systems, right? So the, the, the tools and the, um, uh, the features are there now, our, our next steps are really try to uh, produce guides, content around how do we actually, <clears throat> how do we actually make this, uh, make adopting of these tools maybe as, as easy as, as, as one would hope, right? And uh, that, that obviously is a, is a lot of work in itself. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just maybe pause. I know I've been rambling for a long time, uh, maybe a little bit uh, all over the place. Um, any, um, I don't know any comments from uh, from anybody or anything. <clears throat> totally. Um, just I'm really glad that you did this presentation, Dimitri. Um, I think good, like showing kind of where the project comes from. I think the really special thing about the Carvel uh, project is that like you get this really nice like individual factoring of sub problems. It's like so good for users. It doesn't force opinions on people. And like we've ended up with these very sharp targeted like tools for problems that are like so common for the, the practitioner of container native workloads. And um, I'm just like, I'm very thankful like that, like we're finding maturity uh, and that we're finding like stability that we're picking up uh, like a community of, of folks who are really like passionate about like kind of this next generation of like really healthy tools. And uh, I think that that's what makes Carvel really special. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, um, we, I don't know if you've given like these, this like talk like elsewhere, but definitely um, I would be happy to like signal boost this message. You know, um, we should, we should like propose this presentation like two places and like have people talk about it because 
um, like showing where these things come from. It, it's it's unique, honestly. Like uh, I think a lot of times when you like find popular solutions in the cloud native space right now, it's like the ecosystem is so early and like the problems that people are running into are so broad that many of the tools that solve these problems, they're either only like a single project solving a single sub problem, or you have very opinionated tool sets, right? Like if you look at Helm, uh, which is very early on, right? Before CRDs were even a thing, before it, formal API extensions, like really a thing, Helm was already coming out of Deus, um, which is no longer a thing. It's part of Microsoft now, right? Um, and the Helm has turned into this massive community, but it's a very monolithic and opinionated tool set. And some of those opinions, we've kind of agreed as a community, like, oh, there's a huge trade-off. Like it, it kind of, like some parts are really good and some parts kind of suck. And you can't get away from the parts that kind of suck um, because the tool is built as a monolithic opinion. Similarly, like you, uh, I could point out like the, the Argo project, right? Like massive like community adoption. Um, but it's, it's one opinion that the community is only just starting to factor out into individual pieces. Uh, and that comes from like into its developer platform. And so to get something like Carvel in the ecosystem where it's producing like well-factored individual tools that people can just say, oh, I only want this piece, right? Um, or I only want that part. Like now we're getting away from specific opinions or even getting away from focusing hyper, like hyper-focusing on Kubernetes specifically, right? Like you can use Kbuild and like Docker Swarm. And um, like, I, that's just, I think so special. Like that's unique. Um, you don't see that elsewhere in the ecosystem. Um, so we, we should be talking about this more. You know, we should, we should definitely keep sharing the message. Yeah, I, I think there is definitely, a, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to capitalize on, um, on this decouplement of these different problems and different tools, yeah. Uh, but 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 it's also a messaging challenge on its own, right? The 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 type of messaging that one may uh, may find easier to digest for a monolithic project um, is potentially doesn't just you know uh, apply easily for a project that's composed of the smaller units and whatnot. But that's uh, I don't know maybe maybe that's also true for uh, just. Uh, uh, Composed or decomposed software as well. <clears throat> we uh, we're learning some of these things even in the Flux project, which has been running for a similar amount of time. Um, and like the original Flux V1 was a monolithic solution with some pretty strong opinions, but it was extensible in some really hacky ways. And like as the user base grew, you know, we like outgrew that design and like needed to factor things into individual components. And now Flux V2 is a healthier more individual component extensible ecosystem it's one of the reasons why as like vmware we have other projects that are actually gluing like flux and carvel stuff together is because they kind of both can compose since they're so individual or like so well factored um but still with flux like it has a completely different presentation and there's still like you know flux bootstrap flux install is still like pull all of these components together and give somebody you know, a kind of a default starting point. And um, that's sort of different and kind of speaks to that challenge that you're just talking about, where it's like, how do you help people get started when all of these things can solve so many different individual problems? Yeah, again, thanks you. Thank you for presenting. That's, I learned a lot. Uh, thanks for that, Dimitri. And thanks, Lee, for your, your comments. Uh, we are a little past time. Um, I know we have one thing left on the discussion topics or two things left on the discuss discussion topics. Um, we will probably 